Hello and welcome back to my video series about complex analysis. Now in today's part 21, we will continue what we have started in the last video, where we have connected contour integrals in a complex plane with antiderivatives. You know, this is the groundwork we have to do, such that we can talk about the important Cauchy's integral theorem in the next video. However, now as always, before we start, I really want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. Okay, now let's quickly recall the important result from the last video. There, we have considered a complex valued function f on an open domain u in the complex plane. Then, the conclusion was, if this function has a primitive, an antiderivative, then we know that the contour integral of a closed curve gamma is always zero. Indeed, this was not so hard to prove because we already had the fundamental theorem of calculus from real analysis. Okay, now today we will talk about the converse of this implication. Hence, the question here is, is the fact that the integral of closed curves is always zero sufficient for having an antiderivative? And in fact, it turns out that we have this other implication here for holomorphic functions. Hence, let's immediately formulate this for a theorem. So what we need is a holomorphic function f defined on an open subset D in C. I call it D now because it is something we call a domain. In fact, domain is now a new notion for a subset in the complex plane. However, since it could be confused with the domain of definition for a map, we also use the notion region for it. In fact, this is nothing complicated, it's just a well-behaved subset in the complex plane. There, well-behaved means exactly two things. First, as always, it should be an open set, and second, it's a so-called path-connected set. In fact, some authors just use such a connectness property for the definition of a domain or a region. Therefore, in order to be consistent with such definitions, we should talk of an open domain or open region. Still, I should explain to you what the term path connected means for a subset in the complex plane. However, it's not so complicated, the name essentially already explains it. It simply means any two points in the subset can be connected by a path. More precisely, it means if you take two points z and w from d, you find a curve gamma. And then this gamma has the starting point z and the end point w. And now this fact holds no matter which points z and w we choose, and therefore the set is called path connected. Hence, what cannot happen is that d consists of two separate parts. But of course, still, d could have some holes in it. So for example, this part here of d could be missing, as long as we can connect any two points, we would say that the set is path connected. Okay, there you see, this is the assumption we need, and then we have this converse statement from above. So more precisely, if this curve integral is zero, no matter which closed curve gamma we choose, then the function f has an antiderivative on the open domain d. Okay, so there is the statement, and for the rest of the video, I want to prove it. Indeed, this will be a good exercise for us, because we need to work with the contour integrals. Now, the first idea for the proof here is that we fix a given point z0 in the set d. You see, since we can connect any point with any other point, we can just fix a given starting point. So in other words, for any other point z in the domain, we can find a curve gamma and maybe we should call it gamma z. So there it does not matter how the curve exactly looks like, the important thing is that it starts with z0 and ends with z. And to make our life a little bit simpler, let's say the interval where gamma is defined is the interval 0 to 1. So here, please keep in mind, the point z0 is fixed, therefore the index z here is enough. So in summary, you see gamma z of 0 is z0 and gamma z of 1 is z. And the existence of such a curve gamma z is guaranteed by the path connectness. Okay, now by using this curve gamma z, we can immediately define our antiderivative. Indeed, we can just set f of z, capital F of z, to be the contour integral. So we use our curve gamma z and we integrate the function f. 
However, now at this point, we have to do something which is common in complex analysis. Namely, we need a new variable for the integration. Now, the lowercase z is already occupied, therefore we choose the lowercase zeta, the Greek zeta. Okay, but then the definition is finished, this here defines a new function capital F. Moreover, what you can show here is that the value f of z does not depend on the exact curve gamma z we choose between z0 and z. More concretely, if you choose another curve from z0 to z, you get out the same value f of z. Indeed, how to show this should be clear when you look at the picture here. Namely, you can combine a closed curve out of both curves here. And there we know, by assumption, the integral along the closed curve should be zero. So maybe let's write the details down, let's call this curve gamma tilde. Then, in order to form a closed curve, we have to go backwards for the curve gamma tilde. And indeed, this is something we have denoted with a minus sign in the upper index. Moreover, let's denote the combination of both curves with a plus sign. Okay, then we know by assumption that this contour integral here is zero. Hence, the only thing we have to do is to split it up into two separated contour integrals. And by definition of the contour integrals, we simply know it's the one integral plus the other one. Hence, the only thing we have to put in now is, if we reverse the direction of the curve, we change the sign of the integral. In conclusion, we can bring this one integral to the other side and we get our equality. Hence, now we can definitely say that the function capital F is well defined. And with this, only one thing remains to show that capital F is indeed an antiderivative of lowercase f. In other words, now we want to show capital F prime is exactly f. And indeed, now this part gets a little bit more technical. Now here, please recall, the complex derivative is a pointwise property. Hence, it's sufficient to consider our point z as before. Moreover, now we know this point z has a lot of neighbors in our open set D. In other words, we can choose a whole epsilon ball around it. And that's a good thing, because this means our whole calculation now can just occur in this small epsilon ball. And indeed, we can choose epsilon as small as we want. Now, obviously, we also need another point in the epsilon ball, so let's call it z tilde. We need that because we want to calculate a difference quotient to get the derivative in the end. More precisely, this difference quotient should converge to f of z. And therefore, we look at this difference quotient minus f of z. We do this because then we can look at the absolute value and apply some estimates. Now, the first thing I want to do is to bring f of z to the numerator here. Of course, this is no problem at all, we can just expand this term. Okay, so here you should see, in the end, we want to send z0 to z, such that here we find the derivative of capital F, and this whole thing should then go to 0. And indeed, we will get this by looking at the numerator here. Hence, let's put in the definition of capital F. There, please recall, f of z tilde is given by a contour integral where the curve goes from our fixed z0 to z tilde. And now, of course, in the same sense, we can put in capital F of z. In other words, here you see we have the difference of two contour integrals over the same function. So I would say, let's visualize this in the picture above. So you see, here we have our first curve, gamma z tilde. And the second curve starts at the same point, but goes to z. And now you should see, we can use the same idea as above and use a closed curve to describe the whole thing. In other words, we simply can connect z tilde with z, and then we have a closed curve, where we know that the contour integral has to be zero. Or in order to reformulate it immediately for our case here, the contour integral along this short curve here is the same as the contour integral along this long curve. However, the contour integral along the long curve is exactly what we have here. There, please note, the minus sign here has to be absorbed by the different direction we have for gamma z. Hence, now we can summarize both contour integrals in a single one.
And for having a short notation, let's call this curve gamma index z z tilde. Okay, and now our next idea should be that we also rewrite this third term here as a counterintegral along gamma z z tilde. Indeed, this is no problem at all when we say that this curve here, our curve gamma z z tilde, is just the line. Because then we know that the counterintegral along the constant function 1 is just z tilde minus z. So we know in general it's just the endpoint minus the starting point. Okay, then the only thing missing is that we also have to bring in the constant f of z. Indeed, this is simple, instead of 1 we use this constant. So there you see again, it was very important that we have chosen zeta as our integration variable. Indeed, it's easy to distinguish from z. Okay, then in the next step, we simply rewrite both integrals into a single one. And then you should see, finally we can use an estimate here. And in fact, this will be the estimate we have discussed in part 19. It tells us that the whole contour integral is bounded by the maximum of the function times the length of the curve. So more precisely, here we have the maximum of the two functions in the difference times the length of gamma z z tilde. However, by the definition of this new curve here, we already know the length is just this difference here in the absolute value. In other words, this is the sole reason we choose this line, because now we can cancel here. On the other hand, for the maximum, instead of focusing on the line segment, we can also estimate it with the maximum in the epsilon ball. In some sense, it's just shorter to write down. So at this point I don't have to say so much, because we know we have a holomorphic function, so a continuous function, which means if epsilon gets smaller and smaller, this maximum gets also smaller and smaller. In other words, I can say, when we send epsilon to zero, this goes to zero. However, with this we now also see, if we send z tilde to z, then this goes also to zero. In other words, the derivative of capital F is just lowercase f. Okay, and with this you see our proof is finished. The existence of antiderivatives is connected to the counterintegrals for closed curves to be zero. And now we have learned, for open regions this goes in both directions. In other words, we have an equivalence there. So you see, we are getting closer and closer to this important theorem called Cauchy's Integral Theorem. Okay, and with this I really hope that I see you in the next video. Have a nice day and bye!